This day and age, it's hard to think about what the toy aisle might look like without Star Wars. The popular science fiction franchise has become such a mainstay in the merchandising world that the thought of there being no abundance of product to purchase is just strange. This dates all the way back to the very popular toy line from Kenner, which kicked off in the late 1970s. But believe it or not, there was an era where the option to buy Star Wars related toys was slim to none. By mid-1985, the demand for Star Wars merchandise had drastically slowed, which ultimately led to Kenner canceling the toy line. This led to a period where fans of the films were left with no new toys for several years. And it wasn't until the mid-1990s that we would see the triumphant return of Star Wars to the action figure market. It's the return of Star Wars in 1995 with the power of the Force, today on Toy Explosion. Power of the Force Collection. Darth Vader leads an evil empire towards universal domination. Join a brave rebellion with Luke Skywalker, Han Solo and Chewbacca, and Jedi Obi-Wan Kenobi. Can you stop the empire? Star Wars Power of the Force Collection from Ken After the dry spell of the latter 1980s, Star Wars nostalgia was high, and the brand was about to hit a new boom period in the 1990s. The original films would be released on VHS for the first time as a box set in 1990, and then again in 1995. Brand new video games would hit the popular home console market, and to go along with all of this hype, new toys were a must. The Star Wars license was actually shopped around. Several toy companies from Mattel to Playmates Toys all made pitches in an attempt to land the license. But ultimately, that license found its way back in the hands of Kenner, now owned by Hasbro. Kenner obviously had experience, considering their popular line of original action figures and vehicles for the brand. This experience is likely what helped make that final decision to bring the license back to the company. Now before we go any further into talking about the return of Star Wars action figures, there's one short-lived line of Star Wars toys that we absolutely must mention. In a time where fans were craving new toys for their favorite characters from a galaxy far, far away, there was really only one option available for a short while. And to tell you more about that is my good friend Dan Larson from Toy Galaxy. There was a time nearly an entire decade when there were no new Star Wars toys on the pegs, the shelves, or anywhere else. A time when Han, Luke, Leia, Darth Vader, and Yoda had become a thing of the past. The only way to collect Star Wars was to look backward and seek out the things that existed from years before. Figures, vehicles, and playsets that were getting older and more obscure by the day. Kenner's Star Wars Power of the Force line released in 1985 struggled without a film to drive interest in the characters, especially the obscure characters which made up the majority of the line. Droids and Ewoks both had a single season each of an animated series and humble first waves of action figures. After that, the world moved on. So far on, in fact, that the once mighty Kenner who had, for a time, dominated the action figure market was purchased by Hasbro in 1991. The toy license was so far down in value that one of the only options for collectors looking for new Star Wars figures was a line of Bendy figures called Bendems, manufactured by Just Toys in 1993. This is trash compactor stuff. I mean, a Bendy figure is bad enough, but a Bendy Yoda? That's not even that Bendy. What does it have, like two points of Bendy? Bendy R2-D2? Where does it bend? Why does it bend? If you think likenesses were bad on the pre-photo print Black Series figures, then you don't know about the pain of Bendem's Obi-Wan Kenobi. But a return was building. Fans were beginning to seek out the toys of their youth. Interest in Star Wars was growing, and if the internet had existed, everyone could have come together and let Kenner know directly and more quickly. Kenner wasn't responding to the whispered grievances of young adults talking to each other in the privacy of their own homes. It was the darkest time to be a Star Wars action figure collector, and there was no guarantee that it was ever going to change. The only thing they could truly hold on to was hope. And Bendoms. The Bendoms that I talked about. Back to you, Dan. 
The anticipation of a brand new line of proper action figures and vehicles from that galaxy far, far away was incredibly high. Fans were chomping at the bit to find any news on this upcoming toy line. You see, in the early 90s, the internet wasn't quite the go-to source for finding all of the toy news that you need like it is today. So we had to rely on print magazines to get our latest news on the toy industry. It was the April-May 1995 issue of Lee's Toy Review that gave us our very first glimpse at what was to come. In their coverage of New York Toy Fair, one single photo showing an early prototype of the upcoming brand new Luke Skywalker was shown next to that vintage Luke action figure. It got fans talking and fueled the excitement. Just a few short months later, the first wave of brand new Star Wars action figures hit store shelves. Let's start by taking a look at the new packaging. The first wave is commonly referred to as the orange cards or the red cards due to that orangish red lightsaber like beam of light seen behind the action figures. To the side of the figure is a photo of the character from the film with the signature Darth Vader helmet illustration appearing in the upper corner of the packaging. The shape of the helmet also dictates the shape of the card back as that corner is contoured to the curves of Vader's helmet. This packaging would be the standard for several years to come, though eventually changes would come that would see the orange replaced with green. As a result, some of these figures would end up being found on green cards as well as the orange cards, which resulted in fans seeking out these variations to add to their collections. Keep that in mind as we're discussing these figures because running changes that resulted in figure variations would become a major part of collecting this line for diehard fans. A total of nine action figures were released in the first wave. As we're getting into them, it's important to note the unique design of these early figures. You see, these Star Wars figures are notorious for their overly buff bodies. Seriously, Luke has been working out. They all have. But why exactly was this design choice made? In an interview with StarWars.com, team leader of Kenner's 1995 Star Wars design team, Tim Hall, had this to say. The biggest decision we had was about the importance of balancing the needs of collectors with those of kids. Specifically noted by Tim was the heroism and excitement that kids want in toys today. So essentially, Kenner hoped that more superhero-like proportions would help make Star Wars toys appealing to a generation of kids who are currently infatuated with the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. This brand new action figure of our main hero depicts him with his classic white shirt and tan pants, as seen in A New Hope. The likeness on these early figures certainly feels like a step up from the vintage Kenner toy line, but as you'll notice with this entire first wave, they still aren't quite there yet. We would still be a few years away from the figures looking a little more like the actors from the films. And I know I already mentioned the overly muscular bodies earlier on, but just look how buff Luke is here. His pecs are practically bursting out of his shirt. The articulation is basic on this initial wave of figures, with the head turning at the neck, the arms moving at the shoulders, the legs at the waist, and the torso turning at the waist. Some figures also have pre-posed action stances as well, as you'll come to see. For accessories, Luke came packaged with his grappling hook blaster and, of course, his blue lightsaber. The lightsabers in this new line were a huge leap forward from the solid colored plastic swords and the telescoping sabers of the vintage toy line. Now they have a sculpted hilt that looks much more like the handle of a lightsaber, as well as a blade that is made out of translucent plastic. So earlier I mentioned variations, making this line extra collectible for longtime fans. These new lightsabers were one of the biggest things in the first year that did that. Luke, Vader, and Obi-Wan each came with lightsabers in this first wave, and upon the initial release, they featured longer blades. A running change quickly occurred, shrinking the blades down to a more accurate scale. 
As a result, those longer blades became more sought after. Oh, and if you think that's crazy, there were even some figures with those new short sabers that came in boxes where the insert trays were still sized for the longer sabers, and those became even more sought after. We were just really excited for new Star Wars toys in 95. Much like with Luke, Han Solo is sporting his classic look from A New Hope, and is almost just as buff. The likeness is decent here, but certainly a step up from what we saw in the vintage toy line. Han is one of the figures in this first wave who is sculpted with that battle stance I talked about. He doesn't really have any difficulty standing on his own, but he's always going to be stuck in this slightly forward lunge. He includes two accessories of his own. We've got his standard blaster, which while a little oversized, still does a decent job of matching up with Han's signature weapon seen in the films. He also comes with this larger heavy assault blaster. Of course, it's worth noting that since these figures have limited articulation, these large blaster rifles like this can still only be held with one hand. There's also a strap that allows you to sling it off of Han's shoulder. Chewbacca's overall design in this initial run definitely feels more like a toy than an actual representation of the character from the film, if that makes sense. His furry body looks far more smooth and maintained in this particular action figure, and his face is happy and almost bear-like. In fact, it certainly looks like just a slight upgrade of the vintage figure from Kenner. Their designs are actually quite similar. He's one of the tallest figures in the line, but stands roughly the same height as Darth Vader, even though he technically should be the tallest character. He also includes two accessories of his own. First, he has his classic bowcaster, but if that's not enough for holding off the Empire, he also comes equipped with the larger heavy blaster rifle. Much like with Han, this rifle also includes a strap to allow you to hang the gun off of Chewie's shoulder. Ben Obi-Wan Kenobi is quite the upgrade from the vintage action figure, even if he's still not the best rendition of the character we would eventually see in toy form. The robes looked much more like they did on screen this time, but were handled in an interesting way. They were made of a softer plastic with a split down both sides. Removing this robe would reveal the standard posable action figure underneath. The clothes under the robe didn't quite match what we saw in the film, but interestingly, are quite similar to what we'd eventually see Obi-Wan wear in the prequels. The combination of the sculpted robes and the odd stance of the figure gives Obi-Wan some balance issues, making him one of the more complicated figures to keep standing. Much like with the original R2-D2 figure released by Kenner, this new version for 95 has a vac metalized dome, which looks cool but is a bit shinier than he appears in the actual films. There is also a light piping action feature, where shining a light into the top of R2's dome causes the blue eyepiece on the front to illuminate. Despite the similarity with the shiny dome, the figure is quite an upgrade to that original figure. Instead of just stickers, R2 now has fully sculpted details on his body. And finally, the retractable third leg makes its debut. C-3PO has an ultra shiny vac metal finish, much like his original figure release. He's one of the few figures in the line who didn't get buffed out, which could have been hilarious, let's face it. His limbs are rather skinny and do a decent job of looking more like the version of the character we saw in the films. The arms are bent, much in the manner that 3PO's were often seen. His legs are in a bit of a wider stance, but overall, this 1995 release was a bit of an upgrade over the original. Princess Leia's release in this series was notorious for its, frankly, ugly design. She just doesn't capture the beauty of the princess that later releases eventually did. While she isn't as muscular as the male figures in this lineup, the overall thought process of making the figures bigger and more action-oriented still had an effect on her design. 
Her stance is real far apart in sort of an action pose, and her costume isn't quite as accurate to the film as we would hope it to be. She's wearing the white outfit made famous in A New Hope, but instead of it just being a robe, she's instead wearing a cape and a skirt. Both of these are made of a softer plastic and are removable, revealing a white bodysuit underneath that really doesn't look at all like what we saw on screen. Ah, the Army Builder. The 1995 Stormtrooper fit in line with the rest of the figures in the series design-wise, complete with a large barrel chest covered by that signature white armor. The figure also feels a bit on the stout side, likely because he kind of feels like he doesn't have a neck due to the way the helmet head was designed. He's also another figure who has a bit of a battle pose to his legs, making him one of the figures who might have some issues standing up on his own. But that certainly didn't stop fans from buying multiples to build an army to stand behind Vader. I know I sound repetitive by now, but it has to be pointed out. Darth Vader is just as muscular as the rest of the figures in this first lineup. Now, of course, Vader was always tall and felt like a larger than life villain. He's supposed to be big and scary. So honestly, I didn't think too much of it back when this figure first came out. I absolutely loved it. The cape is made of a softer plastic and just rests around his neck, making it easily removable. He also comes with his signature red lightsaber, designed much like the new saber seen with both Luke and Ben, but with a translucent red plastic for the blade. It's also worth noting that the hilt for this one is a solid black plastic with no extra painted details. This is another area where the figures would go on to see better details and more accurate designs as Kenner and Hasbro move forward in years to come. Of course, you can't have a line of Star Wars toys without the memorable ships and vehicles from the films. Lucky for Kenner, they had already designed a ton of these for their original toy line. So for this first series, Kenner opted to recycle the molds from the originals, usually just updating the deco and adding some sound effect features. Like with the electronic X-Wing here. The new deco made it look much more like the X-Wing that we saw on screen, and the new sound effects certainly made it feel like an upgrade. The TIE Fighter, on the other hand, was handled almost the opposite, as electronics were removed from this release. The mold is essentially the same, except the canopy now has an actual window rather than just a sticker. The wings are much smaller in scale than the wings appeared in the film, but this was for the sake of making the toy sized more appropriately for kids to handle. The Millennium Falcon is mostly unchanged from the original release, but the design from that original was so strong, this seems perfectly acceptable here. The top panels can be removed to essentially reveal a playset within the ship, complete with several scenes from the films that can be recreated with your action figures, including the cockpit, the gunner station, and the Deseret game table. Moving away from A New Hope, we also got the Imperial ATST in the first wave. This version of the Chicken Walker feels a bit smaller than it should, specifically in the head portion, but it's still a really fun toy, complete with a button pressing walking mechanism that seriously cracks me up. And we can open the hatch on top to place a stormtrooper inside, since we didn't have a proper ATST driver figure at this point. And then on the smaller scale, we've got the Land Speeder. The new deco makes it look much more like the version from A New Hope, but it is considerably smaller than it should be. Instead of a place to properly seat 3PO and R2, there are just foot pegs on the back so that they can stand on it. The hood can pop open to reveal a sticker of an engine, and the wheels on the bottom can be lowered to create a hovering effect that actually works pretty well. Off to Moss Eisley Spaceport, eventually we'll get some figures of that scum and villainy that hang out there. It's easy to look back at these action figures now and get a laugh at the lack of proper character likenesses or the absurdly beefed up bodies, but it's important to understand just how huge this particular release was. Star Wars toys were back 
and fans couldn't get enough. At this point, there had not been any new Star Wars films since the 1980s, but that didn't matter. Star Wars was experiencing a renaissance, cementing its staying power and setting up permanent residence in the toy aisles. It's weird to think about a world without a section of Star Wars action figures hanging off the pegs, but that didn't become the norm until this relaunch in 1995 truly showed us the power of the Force. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining me for another installment of Toy Explosion. I really hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I wanna give a few special thanks to a lot of people who helped me out. First of all, my awesome supporters over at Patreon. I could not do this without you guys. Thank you so very much. All the names you see scrolling across the screen, wonderful, wonderful people. If you wanna get in on the action, head on over to patreon.com slash pixeldan, check it out for yourself. I also have to give a massive thanks to my good friend Dan Larson from Toy Galaxy, who not only made a cameo in this episode, but also helped me out with some fact checking and reading over the script. Dan, thank you so much for your support. It really means a lot to me. Uh, also, my good friend Jonathan over at Preternia.com, who was awesome enough to help me out with some of the vehicles that I didn't have. He took a bunch of photos for me. Jonathan, thank you, man. I really, really appreciate it. And just all of you guys, thank you for watching, for always continuing to support me and keep watching guys I got more of this on the way and how awesome is this shirt right this is just the greatest shirt ever until next time my friends